Well, the United States needs diplomats as it needs soldiers, as it needs intelligence officers. Diplomats are part of the first line of defense of the United States, the protection of this nation, the enhancement of its commercial possibilities, its influence in the world, its cultural outreach, all are made possible and facilitated by American diplomats who serve around the world and represent the president, this country, this government, in lands abroad and, and two governments and peoples abroad. They are a necessary part of the transmission belt. They explain, they elucidate, they make clear the purposes of America. Yeah, I think that's a very good question because we're now submerged in many forms of telecommunications information technologies. But think about it for a moment. Does anything replace two people sitting together, engaged in a dialogue, looking at each other, both of whom who know the subject they're talking about, have studied it in depth, and are trying to persuade one another of a course of action? Can you do that electronically? I don't think you can. You can exchange information, you can make a deal that has been carefully prepared, but when you come down to the sensitive matter, relations between nations, face-to-face -face contact by skilled professionals is absolutely essential if you're going to get the right outcome. Well, diplomats are often at risk. It's a hazardous profession. If you walk in the front door of the State Department, you'll see plaques and plaques of the names of American diplomats who've given their lives for the United States in acts of violence, in diseases acquired abroad, ships sunk, planes crashed. Uh, the travel is only one feature. In today's world, unfortunately, American diplomats, and that doesn't exclude any level from ambassadors right down, have been targets of acts of terror, acts of violence. And so we have a tragic history that's growing. The most recent, just to remind ourselves, Chris Stevens gave his life for his country in, in Benghazi, uh, Libya, trying to mediate between the Libyan factions and get some degree of calm and stability in that very troubled but important land. In <clears throat> Dar es Salaam, if you're referring to the attack on the American embassy approximately 10 years ago, uh, one of the early indications that Al-Qaeda was mobilized, had terrific outreach, uh, dual attacks, an attack in Dar es Salaam, an attack on our embassy in Nairobi. Uh, the Nairobi case, if I remember correctly, was more violent, or that is the casualty numbers were greater. But the purpose of this was to show that American power was vulnerable vulnerable to radical Islamic political, a, a radical Islamic political group that the United States could be taken on. They, they, those who oppose our purposes in the world could actually score against us. Very much so. American embassies are the presence, the official presence of the United States in a foreign country. Therefore, it's all too easy for uh, <coughs> a disgruntled national of that country or a group thereof to take action against an American embassy. The first line of defense of that embassy, though, is the nation itself. If it's an American embassy in France, the French government is supposed to protect the embassy. If it's the French embassy in Washington, we're supposed to protect it. It doesn't always work out that way. It doesn't work out in a society that is chaotic as is <coughs> Libya, where there is no really no effective government. So there is no sure way to protect a diplomat. American diplomats serve because they're dedicated to their jobs, they believe they're important, and they're prepared to run the risks. Well, I'm uh, 
impressed that you know that, my son, yes. David Wisner, a <coughs> young foreign service officer, was on his second tour of duty in Khartoum, Sudan, in the day surrounding the assault in Tripoli, the assault on our embassy in Cairo, uh, part of the, in this case, a demonstration of protest against uh, the perceived desecration of the holy book, Quran. Uh, David was on duty in the embassy when the embassy came under siege with outraged mobs. And it was a fairly tense situation. His wife was at home, separated, no particular protection. Finally, the Sudanese police intervened quite forcefully and drove the crowds back, uh, some loss of life and some destruction to the embassy property. Uh, the United States government made the decision at that point to reduce the size of our embassy, and David and his wife Lydia were evacuated. Well, they make a number of sacrifices. The ordinary lifestyle of an American growing up in this terrific country of ours. Um, but they also get a lot. They get the deep experience of living in a foreign country and living really at the top of another man's society, meeting the most interesting people, visiting the most fascinating and beautiful sites, uh, getting a real world perspective as a child growing up. At the same time, you're uprooted. You don't have a steady home. You can't make that circle of friends that we all like to have when we're growing up. Uh, you may have to sacrifice on the education front because the school in Zambia, in my case, was not up to an American standard, so had to work extra hard when you got back home. But on balance, I would argue that the sons and daughters of American diplomats come away richer for the experience of living abroad and with their parents and serving. If their families are stable and the countries are interesting, well, they, they come out stronger and better people. trade, business, investment. Correct. I think American diplomats' role in, in those areas has changed quite significantly. It used to be in the classic times, really through the 1970s, that American diplomats saw their role and the role that was assigned them was to represent the political relationships between the United States and a foreign government in particular. But that became different, it got into the 80s, the 90s, and American business started competing around the world, head on head, and going farther afield outside the comfort zone of a Europe or even a Latin America into Africa and Asia. And here, American companies run into all kinds of problems, problems with local law and regulation, which they may not understand knowledge of the marketplace, knowledge of business partners. Well, an American embassy on the ground has a better chance of being on top of those questions, being able to answer them, being able to guide an American firm. But also, if that American firm gets in trouble, um, for whatever reason, uh, the American embassy is there to try to help it think its way through the problem that it's facing and the normal rules of protection welfare of American abroad would apply if the case got even worse than that, somebody is arrested or some unfortunate outcome. Well, the role of projection of American values is done in a variety of different ways. First of all, done by example. Uh, the quality, the training, the ability to master a foreign language represents the kind of person that the United States has put confidence in to represent it before a foreign government. That sets an example. And the probity, the honor and decency, the way an American carries himself, his frankness, his openness, his willingness to engage, not to sit in the local sports club, but get out and try to explain the purposes of the United States and our interests to as wide an audience as possible. That's one way we do it. There are many other ways. 
uh, we demonstrate what we're about and our values by making it possible for others to come and visit a country and have engagements, be able to speak, appear on television, radio, and American diplomats do that. Uh, they speak for America. Uh, they move around the country and engage audiences across the board. American diplomats also encourage cultural exchanges. When the resources are sufficient, they're insufficient now, uh, promoting American art, American uh, film, American books, American cultural activities so that foreigners can see us, understand us, be able to relate better to the United States, be able to understand why we do things the way we do them and why we ask their help or cooperation. So diplomats impact in a variety of ways, almost too numerous to account, but they're a constant demonstration through the projects, the programs, their lives, their ordinary professional engagements of the values of the United States. That's a very tough question, and you never get it right. Um, the risk is a major factor. Today, if you go around the Middle East, you can imagine from Morocco through Iraq, uh, the lot of an American diplomat is very, 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 t very tough. Very, he's living in, on the edge. Uh, some, he's always living in a highly defended embassy, high walls and secure locations. Uh, he has a large local guard force in addition to the national army or police that's protecting him. His ability to travel around town and around the country is limited. Uh, his movements are often watched by those who do him harm or want to make an example of the life of an American diplomat in order to take revenge or score a point against the United States. So it's really tough. He's got to find other ways to engage, and they're more limited and less satisfactory. So you constantly balance the ability of an American diplomat to understand what's going on in the country, explain it to Washington, his ability to transmit an American message, to engage public audiences, to make his point with the local government, on the other hand, make sure that he doesn't, he's not harmed in the conduct of his mission. The State Department deploys a large security force uh, around the world, and the security officers are trained professionals, and they try to assess a situation, decide what is the safe course of action in any country. Uh, they may err a bit on the side of caution. That's understandable. But getting it right, preserving access and protecting, it's a tough job to get the balance the way you want it. And right now, I fear we're weighed towards the security side, given the situation we're facing in many parts of the world, notably the Middle East. Yes, that's a very important point. At heart, a two nations recognize and exchange embassies and ambassadors. They assume the obligation of protecting that embassy, that ambassador. That's the first line of defense. As I explained earlier, it doesn't always work. If the government is weak, collapsing, or itself is conniving in some manner to make a point against the United States. So the second line of defense is the embassy itself and the residences of American diplomats. Those are overseen the responsibilities lie in the hands of diplomatic security, the security service of the, of the American, of the State Department. They make sure the physical security is up to the standard, the best you can get. They make sure local guard forces are hired and well trained. They conduct liaison with local intelligence and police services to try to have early warning about what might happen. And finally, inside the embassy itself, you often will have a small detachment of Marines who are there principally 
to make certain that in the last moment, the embassy is the embassy uh, codes, the secret codes, the communications equipment is protected or destroyed if the embassy comes under attack and the ambassador is protected as best he can. But the United States does not pretend to be able to protect the entire embassy and its personnel. That's the responsibility of a host government. Yes, exactly. Very important question. Um, there are many multilateral organizations that deal with multilateral issues. The United Nations uh, deals with world political, economic, social issues. We have large staffs assigned to multilateral diplomacy under the UN's auspices. International trade is regulated by the WTO, the World Trade Organization. And again, we have a mission that represents the United States' interests there. And so it is with many international organizations there, Americans with both technical capabilities and diplomatic skills who are attached to multilateral diplomacy. But of course, that doesn't answer all the other things that cross borders in this very mobile world that we live in. And so you go back to the State Department and its ability and other departments in cooperation with it, their ability to send a single message out to many embassies so they all speak with one voice when they approach their host government. Finally, multilateral diplomacy is also the ability of the United States government through the State Department to go out to embassies around the world with a single coordinated message that treats a problem of importance to the United States. Uh, that message carried out by diplomats to foreign ministries and other government agencies, if it's on the same, if they're all singing the same tune, uh, many nations will know exactly where the United States stands. What is your strategy? And then how do you want to execute that strategy? What policies do you want to pursue? If you have a wise strategy and well thought out policies, what are the best ways to pursue them? You can pursue them through diplomatic channels. You can pursue them presumably through intelligence channels. You can pursue them through military channels. You can even use force in extremis. But diplomacy is a means uh, for affecting national strategy, for carrying out national policies. It is not an abstraction on, on its own. It is an instrument, not an end. And that's hard to convey sometimes. People think, well, the diplomats weren't up to the job. Or exactly. Of course, the maintenance of stability in the world, the preservation of the peace, the protection of American interests are the core responsibilities of an American diplomat. That's what he is raised, he's trained, he's taught languages. His career nurtures him in the, in the, with those responsibilities in mind. Uh, it is up to him to take the messages he's given and make sure they're most effective. They're explained in a local language, in a local cultural environment in the best and most effective way. If he gets it through and avoids conflict and finds solutions, recognizes where the common ground between two positions is, recognizes even where a second best solution will be much better than no solution or no understanding at all. And that a diplomat can make a contribution to. And over his life he can learn to how to bring out of the man across the other side of the table how what his interests are. And you match those two interests and see if you can find a medium. You can't always get it. But an American diplomat is unusually lucky because he has the power of this huge nation behind him. Its wealth, its cultural attainments, its military strength, 
the strength of its institutions. Few diplomats get to bring that full weight to bear. That's the kind of huge uh, bear in the room uh, behind an American diplomat. It gives him a lot of leverage. It's a, this is a hugely important question. And the starting point is to understand that the United States' role is to understand what's going on, what the dynamics are, but not to interfere. Just as we would resent enormously anyone who tried to get in the middle of disagreements between Protestants and Catholics, it's not, not appropriate. Uh, for most of his, the history of the Muslim world, Sunni and Shia have managed to coexist. Since the end of the Iranian Revolution, 1979, when a new dynamic revolutionary force came to power in Tehran, Shia communities, who are a minority in most countries they live in, but not in some Iraq being notable, uh, woke up and said, what about us? We've been at the bottom of the ladder. We've gotten the bottom of the, of the rails, the bottom rail in the fence, and we want to have our day. We want to be able to prosper, be protected. They took hope from this incredible event. The same way the majoritarian community, the Sunni, saw a, the order of the past being upset. Um, and this was the beginning about 20 years ago of increasing friction between, <clears throat> 30 years ago, between Sunni and Shia. It has worsened, uh, aggravated, as the whole region has gone into a revolutionary cycle of governments collapsing in the Arab Spring the Sunni-Shia crisis, nationality clashes, Sudan breaking apart, Kurds threatening to leave Iraq, Berbers asking for historic and language rights in Morocco and in North African nations. So the whole Middle Eastern region is sundering around these points, these fissures. Uh, old-fashioned governments disappearing, Sunni-Shia disagreements, religious disagreements, re-emerging nationality agreements. I fear to say that we're in this for a while. And while Iran has changed from a revolutionary to a government more interested in securing the historic uh, place in the region of the great nation of Iran, it's nonetheless stimulated and unleashed a lot of very troublesome characters, Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, Shia dissidents in a number of Arab countries, including in the Gulf. Yes, it was a defining moment in American history. Um, reminded us of the vulnerability of our diplomats. It reminded, the, reminded us of the fragility of our relationships. We counted heavily on the Shah, and one day there wasn't the Shah anymore. Uh, and this huge balancing, balance in the balance of power in the region was just removed. Um, but I think it had another disconcerting side effect. It created a lot of anger and mistrust in this country. Who insulted the United States? Who imprisoned our diplomats? And that's proved to be very difficult to overcome. Even as Iran moves to change its policies, we remember this stain on our national honor. And it isn't just in Washington and New York and Boston and, you know, uh, places with a lot of media. It goes right into the heart and heart of this country. People remember the hostage crisis and it skewed our relations with a really important country in the region, made it difficult to reach an understanding over nuclear matters.
Well, the refugee crisis is enormously serious. Probably something in the order of 30 percent of Syria's population today are refugees inside Syria, inside Lebanon, inside Jordan, inside Turkey, and then in a confusing period, Syria received Iraqi refugees, and they're probably Syrians now inside of Iraq trying to find some shelter from this frightful violence. Uh, this is a disaster. The resources of a little country like Lebanon are completely overwhelmed. Uh, there are a million plus refugees in a country with five million people. Uh, the, Lebanon has no capacity to bear this burden. Same is true in Jordan. <coughs> Neither the facilities, the resources, the food, the water, not to mention making certain that the children and have a place to go to school so they don't grow up uh, without any capacity to refine a life for themselves. The international community has a prime obligation to help and help generously and help in a timely manner. Otherwise, more countries are going to succumb to violence and to the crushing burden of, of, of events, including the refugee crisis. But think about it for a moment. You and I are looking at boats sinking off the European coast, refugees arriving in Italy, in Greece, they are completely related to this crisis in the region and the outflow of refugees. So European countries are being uh, affected by the flow of refugees. It goes back to a core question. How do you get a resolution of a deep civil war in Syria, now in Iraq, uh, other civil strife. What, and what's the role of the United States? It's not simply dealing with the consequences, feeding refugees, but it has to be about finding a political sol solution to the crisis that's generating the refugees. And here our diplomacy's got a lot more to do than it is currently doing. It's always start with remembering the great minds of statecraft, Clausewitz, the German military philosopher who reminded us famously that war is an instrument of national policy by another means. It isn't your strategy. Your strategy is bigger. One of the means of affecting strategy is the use of violence. Um, Eventually, you have to start with the beginning point. What is the goal of your policy? And that means you have to look at a civil war like this and aim for a political way of managing and containing the crisis where the parties realize there's more to getting on with one another than it is in destroying each other. Sometimes civil wars end with a victory. Our own civil war did. Sometimes they end through a compromise. Lebanon is a common and ordinary case. But in the case of Syria, there are going to be no winners. And you need a political outcome, which means the United States has to keep its eye on how it gets the parties to the table because the Syrians can't get themselves to the table. And we can't get them to the table. We can only do it if we have effective communications with other nations with influence, Iran and Russia, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, to herd the Syrian sheep, if you will, into a pen so that they can be sorted out and contained. The American-Indian relationship has radically been radically transformed over the past 25 years. Um, India was a distant secondary interest and Indians looked to us as somewhat hostile and not certainly not very friendly. Um, since 1990, that's changed and it will never go back. Um, we have an interest in India being strong. India 
has an interest in the United States being effective on the world stage. For India, we represent a market, technology, capital, and a sense of security in a troubled Asia as Indians, like Americans, face the rise of Chinese power, the Afghanistans, the Pakistans, and the other troubled areas of the region. The same is true for the United States. We need a strong India to balance, to be the balance in the Asian equation. We have Japan and Korea in the north. We need India to anchor the south and keep a balance, not end up going to war with anyone, but keep a due sense of proportion. So India and we have mutual interests in a strong relationship. And that relationship is about to have another major opportunity when the Prime Minister of India visits the United States at the end of September. And his visit here is presaged by visit of Secretary Kerry and Secretary Hagel and Secretary Pritzker, all of whom will be visiting India at the end of July, early August, to set the ground for the President's meeting with Prime Minister Modi. Well, it, it depends the, met the metrics you, you use. I would argue that India outperforms China in democracy terms. Uh, Indians have just conducted the largest election in human history. 500 million people voted a government into office in a clear and decisive way. China doesn't do that. Uh, you have a sense that Indians, uh, while they're in constant stir and flow, they accept their political order because that's the one that works for them. Uh, China, however, has had about 20 years head start on India and the economics. India came into independence deeply suspicious, having been subject to an imperial power, Britain, of having foreigners own the country. And it went through a long period of believing that it had to protect itself, its interests, not allow foreigners to come in, own, and get involved in the Indian economy. They also believed that only they could take care of their poor. The concept of growth was really not part of the Indian agenda until the 90s. And the 90s, they realized that they were slipping behind, and they began a set of moves that take India to where she is today. Uh, she now is growing, and she will be. There's been some slowing in the growth rate. It'll recover in the next year and a half, two years. But by mid-century, India is going to clearly be one of the world's great economic players. Will it be as large, the economy as large as China's? No, and probably not even by mid-century. But it'll be up there, and it will be one of the top three or four most important economies and markets for Americans, goods and services for years and years to come, not to mention the fact we got a couple million Indian Americans of Indian origin who are terrific citizens of this country and contribute mightily.